Um, so I'll, I'll give a brief background about our three great guests here. Phil Wilson is the founder and former president and CEO of the Black AIDS Institute, the only national HIV AIDS think tank focused exclusively on that black people. Prior to founding the Institute, Mr. Wilson served as the AIDS coordinator of the City of Los Angeles, the director of policy and planning at AIDS Project Los Angeles, and he also served on the Presidential Advisory Council on HIV AIDS. Welcome. Thank you. Vivian Kleinman is a producer, director, writer. She was cinematographer on Tongues Untied and also produced Marlon Riggs' 1992 documentary Color Adjustment. Vivian was also a close friend and collaborator of Marlon's and has ensured his work stays with us and continues to be seen. She was the force behind the 30th anniversary screenings of Tons on Todd, which have taken place across the US and around the world over the past year. Also, Vivian is producer and director on the forthcoming documentary, No Straight Lines, The Rise of Queer Comics. <laughs> director, producer, actor, playwright, and poet, and associate producer and cast member, as you saw, and on tons of time. <laughs> Brian was a member of the San Francisco Mind Troupe, which I didn't know until today, <laughs> <laughs> and founder in 1991 of Homo Afro Homos. His play Civil Sets about civil rights activist Bayard Rustin was produced by the Berkeley Repertory Theater and New York City's Public Theater. Welcome, Brian. Uh, each of you kind of talk about your kind of your first encounter with with Marlon and Tanzan Tai, how you connected to him and, and this and this film. Um, okay, I guess I'll start. Uh, I'm still kind of <laughs> trying to catch my breath. You know, um, um, this film is so many, so many things, and things that we didn't know at the time. Uh, and I guess I would start by saying that this is a film. That, you know, and, and when they talk about old Hollywood and folks with the Sloan, let's get together and put on a show. You know, let's do it in the bar. This is really about all friends, like all friends. And uh, and I'm still reeling from that, you know, like all of the faces and all of the voices and what have you, you know, uh, almost every still, you know, is is of a real person in our lives. You know, everyone who spoke is a real person in our lives. And 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 I will answer your question, but I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's that um, it really brings back what the world lost. Because this film is is about a story, but it's also about a lost generation. It's also about a black gay renaissance that existed at that time. You know, like almost I think almost everybody is in it. You know, from Essex to Rory to Donald to I mean, these are all the kind of artists and writers and what have you. Like every still is is one of those guys, and and I miss them. Um, Every day. Uh, so to, to your to your uh, question, I actually met Marlon early in his career. Um, Marlon and I both were actively involved in Black and White Men together, uh, and we met at a convention here in Los Angeles, which was also the first time we both met uh, Bayard Rustin. Bayard was a speaker at that convention, and Marlon was just putting together the artifacts for ethnic notions uh, at that time. And so, and I had almost literally just come out, and so we kind of showed up at this convention. We were all, you know, very, very young back then. Uh, and Marlon was going around talking to people about this film, about ethnic notions at the time. And we were like, this is really, really cool, but, you know, who's going to let you do this? You know, uh, and as these things happened, you know, basically Marlon said, well, you all are going to help me do this. And, and, and everybody pitched in um, to the degree that they could, and ethnic notions did get made, uh, and um, um, 
and, and a whole bunch of us kind of began, became friends, you know, and, and so that was kind of my first introduction to him, and, and I remember when he said, well, I'm going to have Esther Rolls narrate it, and we were like, she's on television, she's famous, <laughs> and sure enough, uh, he got uh, Esther Rolls to, to narrate it, so that was my introduction, I don't even remember what year that was, you might remember what year that was, but it was finished in the 86. So it was finished, so this would have been like, maybe, maybe right after I moved to California, and maybe like, as early as 82 or something. Um, I met Marlon shortly after he had graduated from the journalism program at UC Berkeley. He started working for a little video company down the hall from where I had an office. They did industrials like duck hunting. <laughs> he was the online editor, all the techie stuff, all these numbers. He's very quiet. And he and I started to talk. and. In short order, we were just howling with laughter. And he told me about this idea he had for a film, Ethnic Notions, and I said, it doesn't sound like a film to me. You're going to, <laughs> <laughs> You're going to film these objects, like the pancake mix Aunt Jemima container, and the little guy holding the little lantern outside. That's going to be a film. And he walked around with these little things. Where did he go? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, enough talk. I have an extra desk in my office. And an IBM Selectric, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And I sit down and start your film, stop talking about it, your so called film. And uh, it wasn't me. Uh, Tongues Untied, let me segue to that. He came uh, to the office again one day and said, I've read this book and I met these people, these black gay poets, and I'm going to do a film about them. Okay, great, what's it going to be? Well, well, I'm going to film like the birds and the trees and just see and just men on the street and we'll hear their poems. Oh, mm. so like a slideshow. <laughs> <laughs> we were good friends. <laughs> um, he said, yeah. Well, in short order, we have tons of time. Mm -hmm. What uh, I should have designed to be shown at three gay bars, uh, one in Oakland, one in San Francisco, and one in Washington, D.C., where you had a friend who was the manager. Um, ended up obviously getting uh, uh, becoming something monumental and life changing for everybody, and that was all because of him uh, almost dying. He uh, had a, a horrible reaction to medication uh, while he was traveling between his family in Germany. Uh, they saved his life, he learned he was HIV positive, and from there he became infused with the life force and the vitality. Uh, that was completely unstoppable. Uh, he did the piece, I'll just, I'll just finish this one other thought, because people really like to hear this particular part of it, especially here at AFI, uh, Film Institute. Um, at every single cut, when Marlon was editing, the question was, is this explaining black gay men, or is this for black gay men? <coughs> if it was for black gay men, it lived. If it was expository, mm. it went out. So here was a piece that was completely driven by the notion of a very targeted audience mm -hmm. that ended up reaching national PBS. Michael referenced it traveling now 30 years later um, around the world. It's been translated now just in, in March. Mm -hmm. It was shown in Turkey, translated into Farsi. It's Turkish and Farsi because there's a large population of people who emigrated, got asylum from Iran into Turkey. So, Tongues and Tide, designed for three day bars, translated into Turkish and Farsi, and shown, um, it'll be shown in South Africa, it was shown in uh, Mumbai, India. Um, the, the response to this notion of celebrating this work 30 years later has been extraordinary. Brian, when did you? Uh, kind of through dating. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, way back in the uh, mid 80s, uh, I was dating briefly uh, the cartoonist whose work you see uh, in particular uh, in the end and in the snap section. I was dating Ruby. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, uh, I was dating a lot of people. <laughs> Rupert liked to have, uh, uh, he didn't drink, and he liked to have uh, 
afternoon teas as his uh, social thing and gather people. And uh, so he invited me to one of those, and uh, that's uh, where I met Marlon. And, but I really got to know Marlon as part of a, a group that Marlon and a couple of other men, in uh, black gay men in the San Francisco Bay Area formed called Black Gay Men United. Um, it was really a discussion group. It wasn't, it was never became a, uh, a formal, a not-for-profit or anything like that. It met in people's homes uh, every other week. Uh, there would be um, a subject up for discussion like, like uh, mothers or fathers or dating or are you uh, a black gay man or are you a gay black man? <laughs> endless arguments, <laughs> passionate arguments that would uh, ensue from that. Um, and we, we, we got to be friends and then uh, when uh, following the, the uh, illness that uh, Marlon experienced and uh, is this, he had another project that he was planning to work on which later became a color adjustment but he put that on hold to make uh, uh, ethnic, uh, excuse me, uh, Tons of Tide here, and uh, he asked, uh, it was uh, summer, he was, he was teaching at uh, uh, UC uh, School of Journalism in Berkeley, and so during uh, uh, summer break, uh, I sat up in the little office uh, across from uh, Vivian there in the old uh, Fantasy Records building, and uh, did basically anything and everything from, uh, gosh, looking at every homophobic joke that uh, um, what's it, um, Eddie Murphy, Eddie Murphy uh, made, and blogging that, you know, so, and, uh, putting through all kinds of things, from renting uh, uh, porn magazines, both black porn magazines, white porn magazines, interracial gay porn magazines, from a magazine store and bringing those in to find the images uh, that we see there. And it's very much, uh, I mean, Phil really said this is very much a community production. The cast that you see in the show are really members of kind of uh, activist out uh, gay community, mostly in San Francisco Bay Area, uh, Washington, D.C. And, and New York City, um, and it was, uh, you know, in the 80s, that was really uh, a handful of people in each uh, city just, you know, trying to make work happen. A lot of it is, came from the poetry community. One of the few things you could do in the 80s that wasn't, and see other black gay men that wasn't about going to a bar or cruising or anything, was go to a poetry reading. Where, Lo and behold, you could you could actually talk to somebody <laughs> afterwards. You could see people, and it wasn't about who's hitting on who or who's wearing the cutest outfit. It was just about being there and with you know being with the poetry and, and hearing hearing voices and hearing your own voice. So uh, in the film, you were, well, I was actually on the community advisory board for KCT here, uh, and the big debate on, on POV, uh, and we had this huge thing. Yes, <laughs> yes, exactly, <laughs> about whether or not they were going to show it, you know, because it, you know, it ended up being, um, you know, public television took it on, from the point of view, series took it on, but every city we had this battle, you know, are we going to show it, are we showing it, and it was one of the battles we had here. <laughs> Oh. oh, okay. <laughs> well, 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 no, t nothing like this had ever been on television. No, it hadn't been on public television, it certainly hadn't been on commercial television. Kind of, uh, you know, the, uh, 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 honest depiction of the lives of black gay men, the kind of explicit, unapologetic sexuality of our lives, uh, the language, um, even just the opening, you know, like a, a bunch of you know, public television stations, just the opening was enough to say, oh, we're not doing this. You no, know, <laughs> let alone when you get further into it. And so uh, um, it, it was funny because um, 
I've been, Marlon and I were good friends, and we were we, we were having this battle because, he, you know, obviously there, there were guys that were in Oakland and San Francisco, and he was making a trip to Washington, and he was making a trip to New York, and, you know, there were a bunch of us who were here in L.A., and we're like, why aren't you coming to L.A.? Why aren't you coming to L.A.? But, of course, you know, there were budget issues and, and what have you. And so I had seen, like, a private screening of the film. No, I think it was just Marlon and me and Jack, actually, uh, in this particular viewing of the screen. Uh, and so the first time I actually saw it, you know, like, in a, with other people, was, you know, where we were kind of reviewing it for, to accept it here, and then uh, we actually did a big production here in, in LA, and it, it just was unbelievable. But it was part of the kind of culture wars going it's on right. against the <clears throat> NBA of National Endowment <throat> Arts, mm -hmm. which funded the film. Jesse Helms on the floor of the Senate denouncing this film. Um, yeah, so there was Pat Buchanan using mm -hmm. a clip of the film in his uh, 1992 presidential campaign mm -hmm. to denounce the NBA. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, right. and, it, and it was also part of the language that, it was one of the catalysts that, that kind of created the backlash and no promo homo uh, with an HIV AIDS work, because a lot of us were talking about how you had to kind of show visibility around folks most impacted. Yeah, well, I'm going to add one thing about the PBS broadcast. Um, there were, it was very curious to see what cities were willing to show Clemson Tide and what cities were not. Detroit refused to broadcast it, period. Uh, Dallas, Houston used it as a fundraising pledge, pledge drive. <laughs> Seattle, uh, they broadcast it, but at uh, 2 a.m. Um, <laughs> politely, if not. <laughs> and I have to say one thing, which is uh, uh, we are now in discussion with POV to have it broadcast again, and it's looking good. unfamiliar to anyone to be so, especially for Marlon, anybody had seen his previous work. We talk about ethnic notions, it's, um, often, it's edgy, but it still it has more of an organized structure. Tongues and Tide uh, was so unique for the time um, that they created a new word for it. It's called, it was called an experimental documentary. Mm -hmm. That term had not been used ever before. I don't know who, what the hell who coined it? Um, when it was streamed in the Bay Area, which is when I first saw the entire piece, uh, after it was first premiered here, and then uh, in San Francisco, uh, there was like, there was enormous applause, and then silence for the longest while, because uh, we couldn't figure out how to absorb both the images, the content, and the filmmaking mm -hmm. together. It was so bold, it was so unconventional, it was so straight from the heart, pure passion. How do you begin to describe something that, where there had been no, nothing preceding it, really? It was, it, it created a new language. Marlon found a new vernacular for filmmaking, is what I would have to say in, in brief. And um, that baton, it didn't come out of nowhere. There were people that influenced him, that he was hanging out with a lot of experimental filmmakers, going to their fancy highfalutin gatherings, the Flaherty, Flaherty seminar in the summertime. Um, so he's absorbing uh, influences from experimental filmmakers. Um, Chin Min Ha, Su Friedrich, uh, Lynn Hirschman, who was the first person to do these direct address to the camera di video diaries, um, were some of the people who influenced him. And then there's been all, all kinds of people who have picked up the baton. Um, Rodney Evans did a beautiful film called Brother to Brother, which uh, was released again theatrically recently, just last year, maybe even just this year. Lester, um, try to see if you can. You'll see the the, the lineage uh, getting passed on. So it's just delightful uh, to see how this it came out pure, as I said five times now, purely out of his heart, uh, with no sense of reaching anyone but his few friends. These guys next to me. Um, that was the audience. That was really the intended audience. So he was free. He had a freedom uh, to do whatever he wanted. There were no constraints. There was no time constraints for, for public television that he had been working for. There were no, no censors whatsoever. He was totally free to do what he wanted. And um, uh, when it was broadcast, 
the one thing that he insisted on was that there be not one frame be changed. That was shocking. At the time, it was shocking. So, I want to add one thing. Would you like one? You were actually part of this whole process. You've been hiding. Michael, I remember Michael coming down the hall uh, as the executive director of Frameline, uh, Bay Area's uh, oldest, biggest, maybe finest, I can't say that. Uh, <laughs> queer funding, queer uh, film festival. And Michael came in to uh, help distribute the film initially. I remember he came down with the draft of the first iteration of a poster. So, how did you first encounter this? <laughs> <laughs> uh oh, am I the interviewer? <laughs> well, I, I, I met working at Fantasy, making documentaries as well, and I think through Mark I met Marlon, and we were distributing films at Frameline in addition to doing the, the film festival, we were distributing films, and uh, I think because of what the film was, and I think what Marlon, um, you know, where he wanted the film to go, we were able to distribute it, I think, theatrically and educational. And was, did California News Film have it too? Not, I think? not, not the longest one. Okay, so, so we were the distributor. So, and then we were, at the time, receiving funding from the National Endowment for the Arts. And then so we got kind of brought into the Tons of Tide controversy, getting site visits from the NBA and a lot of scrutiny. And, from the National Endowments for the Art as well.